Welcome to Polycast, an official podcast of a Bolton Civilization site. Daniel Quick. Makalua. Imran Siddiqui. Hey, Madeline. With guest co-host, Michael Lucas Smith. Can I pray please do the introductions? Woohoo! <laughs> All I have to do is get you to volunteer to edit the episodes too. And- <laughs> no, I'm not going to edit it. I just want to introduce... For ulterior motives. But what should I say about my call? Just make something up. Yeah. <laughs> Our celebrity programmer from the day with a cute accent. Oh. <laughs> Welcome to Polycast, an official production of Apolitan.net. This is Kay Madeline, and this is the first time that our new team for this year is together. We have uh, mm-hmm. Dan Quick, who you know is Dan Q. Say hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. We have Makalua, who is my female girl and is going to give me moral support. Definitely. <laughs> We're going to need it with him, Ron. The other guy who, let me get this right, I'm Ran Saitakai. <laughs> <laughs> Did I get that right? No. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> I've never oh, actually huh. talked to him before today, folks, and... Posting here reminds me of my little brothers, so I expect to get teased a lot, so I figured I would start it. And we have a guest host today, Michael, who is from Australia. We called him in at the last minute, and also it's like past his bedtime, so. Well, past my bedtime. G'day. Michael wants to be saying goodnight, but. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> <laughs> the color of his is very important. We <laughs> Fist leaf. That he finds the neighboring cities similar shades of his color and makes it hard to determine which city belongs to which sieve irritates him. Well, Bismarck's got the worst color. He's a very light gray. Yeah. 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 And I can't remember off the top of my head who it is, but there's like three or four sieves that are all very close shades of darker green. And I've mm. had all three of them next to me at the same time. And I'm like, <laughs> which one are you? Am I attacking you or you? I think a lot of people agree with random colors, though, it seems. Yeah, have it so that the colors are random. And he talks about, you know, choosing seven... Distinct colors on standard, that's the thing. If you get so many sieves in the game, you're going to have to have different mm. shades. And some of them can be quite close, but if they're too drastically different, perhaps it's just too hard on the eyes. That could be true. Well, I would kind of like it if it would just default to having the sieves colors you can tell the difference of instead of always having Russia being red. But what if I'm trying to play India and they're not my pretty shade of purple, then I'm yeah, like, <laughs> So you should be able to pick your own color and then... India's now fuchsia and, you know... <laughs> oh, <laughs> In the news, Civilization Revolution's Wii version on hold indefinitely and a first DS preview, and is Civilization IV Beyond the Sword a commercial failure? The discussion broadens to cover sales tracking in North America in general. Sizzling in forum talk, should governments a la Civilizations 1 through 3 or Civics a la Civ 4 be present in any Civ 5? What if any unit or units should be made available between the frigate and destroyer and the building warriors and other eventual outdated units past their obsolescence? The vault contains an interlude courtesy last episode, the I'm so bad at Civ 4 list. In the Senate, we talked about the appeal of marathon and epic speeds, and an interesting version of a succession game called Divine Intervention. Here's what's been making news in the Civ community. So we start off on a Civilization Revolution. Two things. Number one, we have a preview for the Nintendo DS at last, but we also find out that the Wii version has been postponed indefinitely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you postponed the DS version. <laughs> There's more DSs out there, though, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's really besides the point, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Market share is never beside the point. They say they're focusing on... 360, PlayStation 3, and Nintendo DS, probably because they ran into problems using the Wiimote, I assume, and putting that in. I remember we had this discussion a few weeks ago about how many buttons there are on the Wii, and uh, perhaps those were some limitations, 
which Fraxis didn't particularly want to deal with while they were doing the rest of them. Because I believe the DS, doesn't that have a stylus? Yes, yes, it does. And on the DS with Sivrev, you can either use the stylus or you can just use the buttons that are on it. Your choice or combination. I do like the fact that they talk about multiplayer over Wi-Fi for the DS. That sounds really cool. Assuming you have friends to play. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can find people in the mall. And and any skill at multiplayer. But... Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, it beep when you, you know, come across a fan. I'll sit by Macy's. You sit over there. <laughs> Just don't talk to me. <laughs> don't look at my screen. And they do have an obligatory picture here of Tank vs. Ninja. <laughs> it looks pretty crap, though. I mean, that's just my opinion. But I guess I'm not used to playing DS games. Well, perhaps we're spoiled these days by 3D. I mean, it needs to be... 2D on the DS just because of the, the capacity. I mean, the gameplay is the same. It's the UI, the user interface that's really different. Yeah. I wish on the PC it was still 2D because it makes me dizzy, but that's just me. I'm old-fashioned. You need the 3D so that you can rotate the map and click on your city when the, there's a unit in front of it. Well, we need the 3D because 2D games won't sell, so I'm willing to sacrifice because <laughs> I want the game to stick around, so I don't complain too much. There are very, uh, you know, few quote-unquote proper games coming to the Wii in, in 2008. There's just mini games and that sort of thing. So I, I'm a bit surprised that it's being delayed indefinitely. It should be a corner of the Wii market to latch onto, for Wii owners can't buy for their system what's not offered. Because already the Wii development was staggered, so I was not surprised that they might say, well, we're going to put it on hold until... Uh, we were able to finish the Xbox 360, PS3, and DS version because Fraxis wants to do all of this in-house, and I certainly understand and appreciate that, and I think it's going to be a better game because of that. But then, once that's done, since they've already started development on the Wii version, I know I don't know how far along it is, but it would then seem like something to pick up after that because it's, it wasn't supposed to come out till the fall this year, so I guess that's really what surprised me that it's on indefinite hold when uh, they already started development on it and uh, they can also gauge reaction to the game once it comes out for the other platforms. That just helps me decide what console system I'm definitely not going to buy. <laughs> well, it makes me want to buy a DS just so I can get Civrev. <laughs> this preview had lead programmer on the project, Don Wunschel, and uh, producer uh, Clint McCall, both employees at Paraxis. Something that will probably be brought up in an upcoming Modcast episode is that there is no specific mechanism in place for customizing the game on the DS, and for that version being able to mod it on any other version, as far as we know, that's not going to be around. But what Wunschel says that but should we come up with a second game, I don't see why we couldn't come up with something like that in the future. So, in other words, folks, if you want to be able to mod Civrev, then I guess you need to buy it, so they decide to make a second one. Yep, there you go. I could see that happening on the 360, but not on the DS. Yeah, and it's easy to share content and stuff on the 360, have maps and mods and all that kind of stuff, like you do on the PC, but on the DS, it's a bit tricky. Yes. <laughs> All right, so next topic is Civilization 4 Beyond the Sword a commercial failure? We failed. <laughs> Have we all bought BTS in this grouping? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got it. Yep. I love it. All right, we're doing our part. Well, now here's the question. Have we bought it from brick-and-mortar stores, or have we bought it online? Or Online, but not downloadable online. That was a uh, point of contention, I guess. I bought it from a brick-and-mortar store. Well, I went yeah. to a real store. I was actually on vacation with my family the day that it was released, and I didn't get it until about a week later. Mm. So mm. I was late, but I got it. <laughs> well, it looks like the top ten best-selling games. The numbers for the top ten seem to be small anyway. At some point of 2007. Yeah, it says, you know, poor marketing, question mark sort of thing. I, you know, the only reason I ever knew about the game was because I was already in the community. If I was outside the community, I wouldn't have a clue to be on the sword to come out or what it was or why I should even care. Hmm. 
My father played Civ Four and Warlords, but then he now he's on uh, Gal Civ, and he didn't know BTS was coming out. No. Of course, he's not exactly you know the type that follows forms or anything. But. Well, I did find it surprising in the top ten best-selling games of 2007 for the PC that not that it's in an expansion pack for The Sims, but the fact that. The number of units sold was under 300,000, mm-hmm. and in fact, the bottom five are under 300,000 for the entire year. I just yeah. was kind of like, wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, I mean, they're all kind of pretty clustered together, but then, of course, you've got the World of Warcraft Wump. Yeah, 2.25 million. <laughs> yeah. I'm a part of that, I guess. <laughs> and that's a subscription thing, too. Two of those in my house. Two. Well, happy and me. How much is World of Warcraft a month? Uh, fourteen ninety five. American, I don't, I don't know an Australian. Yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, if I buy Beyond the Sword for eighty dollars Australian versus playing World of Warcraft for a year. Well, yeah, Blizzard's really onto a good thing. <laughs> mm. Well, I yeah, definitely I got my money's worth of enjoyment out of Beyond the Sword. Oh, and then some for sure. I've played it about a handful of times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what you're doing. <laughs> of course not, it's Imran. Yeah, it's only count brick and mortar sales. So yeah, that doesn't count a those that you would like a physical shipment product that you would buy online or an actual downloadable product. Well, that sucks. They need to start counting that. There's your answer. That's why they're all so low. Uh-huh. Yeah. So we don't even have a clear picture of the U.S., let alone worldwide sales, because this only tracks U.S. on top of it. Right. So when you get statements, for example, like in the article, computer retail game sales in the United States was a decrease over last year's results that only totaled $910.7 million as opposed to $970 million in revenue. That's, as we've just, reasons why, we've just said that that's misleading. Uh, so I think this is worth taking note of, but at the same time, we don't have a complete picture even of what they're talking about here. So I'd be interested to see comparable sales from Europe, for example. I'm kind of disillusioned by this top ten list anyway, considering The Sims is in there so many times. <laughs> so many times. I really don't believe that many people are buying The Sims. I was going to say, this SimCity 4 Deluxe, now I'm a SimCity fan. I, actually, it's one of the reasons why I ended up getting the original Civ as a Christmas present is because I played SimCity. And, but was that really released last year? Mm. No. No, because I think I bought it year before last or something. I didn't know oh, there was maybe... SimCity 4 Deluxe. The Deluxe Edition combines SimCity 4 and the Rush Hour expansion pack. Release date on Amazon says September 22nd, 2003. <laughs> so there's people buying it in 2007 at such a rate when it was released four years ago. That's amazing. And it makes number six out of ten. So again, this is either another sign that A, this list is incomplete because their data sources are incomplete, or B, why are we even doing this podcast anymore? Because as Michael said in a voicemail to us earlier, PCs are dead. SimCity cast. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe because it sold, it was like in the $5 bargain bin at the brick and mortar store, so people picked it up. There you go. That That's could be. Point. Yeah. Mm. One theory. And I don't think that the numbers would change that much. I don't think too many people, if you could actually, uh, like a downloadable version of that, I don't think too many people would be doing that. And I would think that a lot of people buying newer games now would look at, if not downloading it, I'm not sure I want to have like download versions, but mm-hmm. it's definitely nice to be able to order it online as opposed to yeah. dealing with a brick and mortar store, usually because you can get a better price besides the convenience. Maybe we should try a new tactic. World of Warcraft, Civ 4 edition. <laughs> <laughs> Is this just World of Weld? <laughs> Civilization, the MMORPG. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that would be scary. This is Forum Talk, where we investigate hot Civ issues in the forums. Do you want Civ 5 to have civics or governments? It's a poll. And apparently the question by Hosum is, what do you want? Civics or old-style government? And civics are winning 88.5%. I'm not even sure it even makes sense. I mean, you can't really replace all of the civics with governments anyway. I don't think he's saying replace all the civics with governments, but take out civics 
and just replace them with the old style government thing like they were in Civ 2 and whatnot. Yeah, that, although I would even append that slightly rather than saying old style governments that I'm going to bring up Civrev again, and I realize it's not a PC title, so you Civrev haters out there, just plug your ears for a moment. You should have said, bite me. <laughs> <laughs> Although I still believe Civic should be in Civ 5 as opposed to governments, I wouldn't necessarily say old-style governments, simply because that what's up and coming in Civrev, governments are being overhauled. And if you check out my Civrev preview, which is really the only reason I'm mentioning this now... <laughs> You can see the descriptions of most of the governments, except for the one that they haven't even decided what it's going to be yet. But So it's pretty hard to vote on it, then, if we haven't seen the new stuff. Well, that's why I would amend the poll, but I can understand that perhaps they want to just say old-style governments for now, because the development for CivRev, of course, is, is still changing. And Balancing all that stuff has to, got to be a chore. Yeah, so the old-style governments of, of Civ, Civ 2, Civ 3, or some combination of the three. Well, I forget who said it in the thread, but going by memory, it really does seem to me that when there were governments, it was really obvious which one is going to be best. And with civics, there's more of a choice. You know, you have to make your opportunity cost and stuff more than I had to in the old ones. But I haven't played them for a while. Yeah, like there was the, you know, one of those tips when you start loading a game is paraphrasing badly. Don't switch to the newest civics just because they're newer. It might not be. Yeah. good for your circumstance. You actually have to stop and think it's not just, oh, well, farther along the technology tree, time to go to this government and leave this one behind. Really, democracy was almost always better than Republic, if I'm remembering right, in the old versions. Although I suppose with democracy, it depended upon your playing style. If you're builders like you and I, yeah, but if you were yeah. more, more longer. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you could go to war in Civ 3? I you personally, or, or is this a general question? Yeah, I didn't even realize that was an option. Oh. <laughs> Someone points out that it's a bit unrealistic that you can suddenly swap your civics every five years or less, and you abolish slavery for 140 years and then suddenly bring it back. <laughs> civics should actually spread a bit like religions, and percentage of population that doesn't want slavery is actually going to make a difference to your happiness if you do bring it back. I like part of it, but not part of it at the same time. Perhaps you might want more time. For example, if you have a larger empire, just being in anarchy for one turn, just changing one civic, as opposed to a smaller empire, maybe that should be changed. But this, um, what if you were in caste system for 100 turns and switched to slavery for 10 turns, and then you switched back? In kind of real-life history, there were periods of time in, say, the French past, where villages up in mountains had no contact with the main Paris capital at all, and people from Paris visiting them would often be killed because they would be carrying strange things and speaking in a weird accent. So the whole anarchy idea actually should shrink as communication gets better. Hmm. Oh yeah, that part I like. Styles RJ says you could have an overall government thing, and then you customize a different civics applicable underneath. So each government has different civics, each with a different benefit. Oh yes, try and balance that. Well, I kind of like that idea because he brought up, not to harp on Smack, but Smack kind of did that. You know, every government, and I forget what they called them, but everything had positives and negatives. And then when you're picking your combination, you have to look at how they combine, and that was cool. And I would argue that you can do that right now with civics. There's plus and minuses for, for each civic. Yeah, what, Sometimes it's direct and sometimes it's indirect. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, there were direct ones there. Like, you make less money or you grow less fast, stuff like that. Your people are less happy. So you just never staple them. I kind of like being able to have an emancipated democratic communist state. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like utopia right there, isn't it? Yeah. Just add in a bit of socialism somehow. But, but you could probably do it the other way, too. <laughs> I mean, like, democracy could say, you know, you could have an option to be capitalistic or socialistic or communistic or fundamentalistic. <laughs> There's this option in the poll that says, don't care as long as one's in. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, would be banana if it was a poll on Bali. <laughs> Between Frigate and Destroyer, this Colossian asks, would you like to see something between Frigate and Destroyer? Because naval warfare is fine, but destroyer is uh, too strong with 30 strength, and even ironclad 12 is not so good. So he's saying we go from frigate at 8 strength, ironclad at 12, and then 
more than double way all the way up to destroyer should there be something in between it's kind of realistic though i mean in real history that's basically what happened yeah what would you put in between old navies just disappeared well he's suggesting dreadnoughts which is interesting <laughs> aren't dreadnoughts like big battleships <laughs> duh <laughs> But they were a lot heavier and slower, and they might not necessarily have had as much firepower back then. Because mm. he's talking like World War One, not World War Two. Super kaboom. Super kaboom. <laughs> what is this, a Japanese game show? <laughs> <laughs> it would be a lot more fun if this was a Japanese game show. <laughs> that would be a lot weirder if it was a Japanese game show. I'm not sure if it can get much weirder, but <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't necessarily think it's needed. I mean, I understand why some people are like, we want something in between, but... You go through those eras so fast anyway, I don't think you'd even notice. That is true. Well, even in now, real history, it was a kind of a weird transition. Mm -hmm. It went from frigates to double-hulled frigates to ironclads in the space of like 10 years. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there was some rapid expansion in naval technology, the way to say it. I mean, from interesting changes between, say, if you're looking at, looking at the American history level, when you had uh, the American Civil War, and, you know, compared to World War I, which was, what, a difference of less than 50 years. I guess after they got ironclads and there was no war, mm -hmm. it was all trade shipping that really pushed the barrier, and we got all our iron ships and steel ships at that point, and then when war came, that's when it really took off, right? Yeah, uh, well, I guess even in American history, you had, if I recall correctly, in the turn of the century, you had what was known as the Great White Fleet, which was, you know, a bunch of destroyers. They were battleships, but I guess uh, compared to modern ships, they were more like destroyers or whatnot. But, I mean, very quick change is what I'm trying to say in, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think we've already got enough units in the game. I like Tantor's suggestion, which she says... Uh, I'd like to see the destroyer nerfed. I guess I like part of his suggestion that you actually modify destroyer, maybe not be quite so strong instead of it having it being 30, perhaps knock it down to somewhere in the uh, lower 20s as far as the strength goes. That would be reasonable. Yeah, that could work. Yeah, I don't know. There's kind of this weird thing going on at that period of time where a destroyer would come out and it would be tested in battle and flaws would be found and then they would upgrade it. So having it fixed on one specific strength almost doesn't make sense. No, but it's hard to kind of make it fluctuate. You try to approximate, I guess. You'd have to, like, fill it out with four or five different versions of destroyers. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then it gets really complicated as to how do you determine what strength it is. And Yes, let's add more units. Let's make it more like call to power. <laughs> <laughs> let's add more randomosity so you can't predict what you're going to get. I'm going to build a fleet of destroyers, but this one's 24 strength, and this yeah. one's 23, and that one's 27. It's like, how did I get a 15? Crap! <laughs> the 15 is called cannon fodder. Seems it costs you less. <laughs> Plus, he says a modifier against certain other ships, such as uh, submarines. Yeah, submarines really don't get played up very well. Mm. They're pretty crap, actually. Whereas, you know, they ruled the seas during the early World War II. And in Civ Four, this is what you do along your coastline, on the wall of submarines. Oh, look, fleet incoming. Yeah, but the wall of submarines doesn't really help you defend, even. They're just not strong enough against regular battleships, and it just doesn't work. JKP1187 hits a nail on the head, I think, here, when he says, uh, you know, the designers chose to favor oil-based navies over coal. I understand this decision, and from a gameplay perspective, I think it works fine. Uh, I agree with that for the most part, except for maybe the modification to the destroyer there. It says, in truth, my desire for the armored cruiser comes from historical nostalgia more than anything else. And, yeah, realism does not necessarily translate into good gameplay. For those really looking for something between frigates and destroyers, or perhaps something even more, I'm not going to go into too many details because this might actually be better covered on another show that we do. It's a mod from Wolf Shane's called the 1850 to 1920 Enhancement Mod version 2.0 that adds not just one ship between frigate and destroyer, but a number of ones. If you're interested, you can check that out. Are we just about to do the why am I not allowed to build warriors later in the game? <laughs> because that one is just kind of funny. <laughs> oh, please. This thread, Illusion13, is saying why am I not allowed to build warriors later in the game because he wants to do a Zerg rush of warriors. <laughs> 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 it wouldn't be very useful. It probably wouldn't even work. 
<laughs> I don't know. Sometimes the barbarians work when you don't think they will. Well, I mean, there's a battleship in that city. I mean, hell, who knows? <laughs> 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 but would it be fun? And for those listening and are not certain what exactly a Zerg rush is. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh. Don't read the first part of that book. <laughs> Fast forward. <laughs> I didn't even really play StarCraft, but I know what that is. It's called Remember the Way Barbarians Worked in Civ 3? Yeah, that's a <laughs> It's like Raging Barbarians. <laughs> Exactly, when you had your era change and there would be this huge stack and you'd be like, oh, crap. Raging Barbarians is actually hard. You, like, play it on Prince or higher and uh, yeah, they just come at you constantly. Yeah, and if they hit the right city at the wrong time, they can really mess you up. Mm-hmm. That's why they're called Raging and you're on a higher difficulty level. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you build a great wall. <laughs> yes, great wall. But then what's the point? What are you using is the Raging Barbarians to attack all the AIs then? <laughs> and the problem with that would be... <laughs> and? <laughs> yeah. And to get free XP without putting my cities in danger. Yeah. Kelly, why don't you tell us about your contributions to this threat? Well, I was guessing at what a Zerg Rush was, and I was a little bit off. <laughs> just a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little. But uh, some games, I build warriors for a long time, even when I shouldn't, because I like to play Limbo on the power graph and see how low I can be, and they don't try to beat me up. Mm. Really? What level do you play that on? Uh, well, I've done it on Emperor for culture games, but I've picked my opponents for this. For uh, Hall of Fame games with the CFC, Yeah. you're allowed to pick your opponents, so I pick the ones that aren't likely to attack me. You know, I don't invite Monty to that party. <laughs> Or Isabella. Right. <laughs> and it's fun. But I mean, I have had games where my highest units at the end, when I won Cultural, were Longbowmen that I got for free when I flipped the other Civ Cities. Because I've even had the AIs when they get desperate, even if you're stronger than them and you have like a uh, defense pact with another strong AI. If they get desperate, they'll attack you anyway. And I don't usually do defense packs. So then one game, after I had won it, I went back to see how many I could sign. I signed one with everybody except for Churchill to see how many negative points I would get with him, and he really wasn't happy because they said that you have signed defense pack with our rivals. <laughs> and I couldn't tell if he had enough on his hands because I couldn't ask him to declare war on anybody because I had a defensive pack with them. <laughs> so it was always, surely you must be joking. So I never would know if he was going to come beat up on me. So that's kind of a scary world. But I was only testing. So when you said that you were testing this and you were on Emperor Lover and going for a culture victory, or uh, no, that one was Monarch. It was on uh, MCs. And Churchill was my neighbor, and Ramses was my other neighbor. But what I like to do: put off rifling or military science, usually rifling, so that I can have uh, like blitz on my privateers, yar, so that I can keep making basements, so I can get city raider promotions. And then upgrade those units. So it's not exactly building warriors forever, but it's building obsolete units for a long time. This user R underscore Rolo1 puts forth that the mechanics of combat and Civ 4 play are strongly against the Zerg type brushes, unless the Zerg unit can do collateral damage. That makes some mention specifically about BTS, of course, uh, disallowing uh, siege for complete kills, so that if you want to do a Zerg rush in Civ 4, just dust off the vanilla or Warlord's disc and mass catapults. <laughs> That's true. Mm. Pretty much. And the other thing is, I mean, of course, it's not a perfect match because, you know, StarCraft is a real-time strategy game, which makes, you know, dealing with, say, a ton of units a complete pain in the ass. But there is that where in Civ 4 is turn-based, so you fight them one after one after one. As probably shows, I only play against the AI. I don't play multiplayer with these incredible strategies of mine. <laughs> it's hard to kiss up to another person and make sure that they won't. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, if you want a Zerg Rush, play multiplayer. <laughs> Chariot Rush. That sounds like a great name for a band, if they were ever to get a band together. Chariot band. Rush. All About Civ. It's a good name. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't asking for your opinion, so... <laughs> This is a Vault segment with topics cut from earlier episodes but have found relevance again later. 
From episode 36, recorded on January 19th, 2008, with Dan Q, Makalua, Imran Siddiqui, and Ra. The I'm so bad at Civ. That's, oh, that's fun. pretty funny. So, yes, I'm so bad at Civ for that. Thread started by Lancer. You know, he says in a later post, we really should work on a top ten list. Well, guess who beats oh. Lancer? Oh, God. <laughs> Dan and his top ten lists. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo, top ten. All right, do the top ten. <laughs> well, we could all say what one of our favorites. I always liked the My You You is in the town drunk. I always I thought that was good. Yeah, Rob will just go out for a cigarette. Just go on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah let me know when the top ten is done, and don't attack my capital while I'm gone. At number ten, when I dig a mine, it's yours. <laughs> From Lancer. Uh... This is the top ten, not the bottom ten. Yeah, really. Oh. <laughs> I hope you use better judgment on the later ones. No, okay. Number nine from Eris. I only get coal when it's Christmas. <laughs> are you reading the same thread we are? <laughs> Aren't you taking your cigarette break yet? What? <laughs> <laughs> Number eight. <laughs> Better be better. <laughs> I think Ra will agree anyway, at least with number eight. My unique unit is the town drunk from Finchak. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> number seven from Solemn Wee. My scientists keep insisting that I divert all research to funny hats. Yeah, that might be a sign that you're bad at Sif 4. Number six, Lord Avalon. One worker built a farm. Another replaced it with a cottage. The first one then built the farm again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Number five, from Theban, I circumnavigated the goal and everyone else's ships got plus one movement. I hate when that happens. Number four, from Lord Avalon, if I found a religion, the holy city gets wiped out via volcano. Dang those random events. Number three, from Eris, my great scientists spend all their time playing Civ or posting about it on internet forums. <laughs> I like that one. That was uh, cute. <laughs> Number two, my city's asked to join the barbarians. Yeah, yeah. And number one reason I am so bad at Civ for that, I lose it to Taurus. <laughs> <laughs> I did like that one. From Theban. Yeah. I like the one the uh, Super 49er says, I'm so bad at Civ for that, all my guys say I hate you when activated, not just the Incas. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I, I, also had, I also had five other ones I liked, but I took them off the list and I made them honorable mentions, although I'll probably hear, why wasn't that like number 10 and number 9? Because those were horrible. Yes, All right, right, go ahead. Also from Eris, the fifth honorable mention, my great engineers are still trying to make Lego blocks <laughs> fit into each other. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> and from Eris, also my great artists use crayons badly. <laughs> <laughs> From Theban number three, when running the slavery civic, my citizens whip me. <laughs> In Soviet Russia, <laughs> slaves whip <laughs> you. <laughs> number two, from Solemn Wee on the honorable mentions list, I created a Medic 3 explorer, then sent him out exploring. <laughs> yes, why would you do that? Number one, honorable mention, my great spy turned out to be a mole. <laughs> from Lord Avalon. <laughs> I miss this one. I tried to build the Apostolic Palace and wound up with the Vegas Wedding Chapel. <laughs> I read this thread to envy the other people's accomplishments. Welcome to the Senate, where we discuss game strategy. Let's talk about what is the appeal with Marathon Epic, as Sif McNutt uh, asks, <laughs> why do people play with Marathon and Epic length games? And the reason is because it's better. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That's the way the game should be played. I think it's so funny that so many people talk about it's easier to warmonger on the slower speeds, because it probably is. But I am typically not a warmonger, and I my usual default is epic. I play all kinds of speeds because I do, you know, Realms Beyond events, and I do the Hall of Fame gauntlets, so I switch around all the time. And quick drives me crazy. I cannot adjust to quick to save my life. But if I'm just, you know, doing something for myself, then I'll, I usually... I think it's better to make a strat... Strategic 
type of game when it's in an epic or marathon mode. Normal and quicker just seems almost like a speed sieve. Not good for multiplayer, though. <laughs> the epic and marathon just doesn't work. You won't be there for a couple of days if you try epic and marathon and multiplayer. <laughs> yeah, marathon. <clears throat> You know, you play the quick version of multiplayer and it's essentially someone will have the timer set to 30 seconds and you're playing on quick anyway, so you're practically playing a real-time strategy game. Well, I'll play uh, Over the Land with my husband sometimes and uh, he kind of has to bring a book later in the game because I have to go through all my things. <laughs> 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 we don't play with a timer. He's patient with me. He sits there and does his thing. <laughs> uh-huh. I'm with Civ McNutt. I don't see the appeal of Marathon or Epic either. Normal is just fine for me. Oh. I don't need to recapture this, the pacing of the older Civ games. Although at the same time, I don't find Marathon and Epic appealing. I don't find Quick appealing either. So Which is ironic. Despite my last name, I know that seems like a contradiction. <laughs> Dan Marathon. <laughs> Dan Normal. I was wondering if he's going to qualify that, you know, in the game. You know what, Michael? That's probably the first and only time anyone has ever put those two words in the same sentence. <laughs> Dan and normal. <laughs> well, Dan just takes what they give him. That's what it is. <laughs> I don't know, Dan. I think you should play the other one. Have you played the other ones, Epic and Marathon? Not since the early days of Vanilla. Has it changed much? Um, give it another shot. I don't know. I like it better. It adds a little more strategy, I think, to the game because it's a bit slower, more turns, and I guess for warmongers it's better. And if you do something stupid, you have more time to recover. <laughs> well, there's that too. <laughs> Which is always good for me. Are you a warmonger, Emma? No, but every once in a while there is a war. And you don't play multiplayer, I think. No. I'm a builder. Well, he doesn't play Civ, so... Yeah, well, th- there's that too. Well, right, but... Today he's acting like he plays so. I mean, he even used the word strategical. Uh-huh. <laughs> Strategery, even better. <laughs> along with that. <laughs> yeah. If you're, like, playing a war game and you're on quick mode with AIs and not multiplayer, yeah, on the higher levels you really, really get crushed. The AI builds these ridiculously large stacks and just obliterates you. But that's mean. <laughs> <laughs> You need Marathon and Epic to, you know, get your diplomacy sorted out and build a, an army to match. And Well, maybe you do. <laughs> well, Marathon feels really different to me than Epic. Normal to Epic is less of a jump than Epic to Marathon, it seems to me. It takes mm. 80,000 turns. Well, I just don't have well, that yeah. Well. Exactly. My games last so <laughs> long anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I like the game to be a little bit longer than normal, but when it gets down there to where it takes 20 turns to build a scout, or longer, and it's like, okay, no. There's longer, and then there's just painful. (laughs) Yeah. See, to me, everything is always about balance, and I just find normal to be the nice balance between, as I said, not going too fast and not going too slow. So there. (laughs) That's very sweet. Mice post a thread called Divine Intervention, basically plays a game online 30 turns at a time, and then after he posts a save, the first to claim, got it, can take the save and go into World Builder and do something like, you know, erase half of his cities, erase half of his military, erase, you know, whatever, add some resources. Well, Mice is a toad on that case. He's hysterical, so I can't imagine anybody else coming up with this, but... The fact that this approach validates using World Builder is a good thing? <laughs> it's good for you. Because <laughs> World Builder is Dan's favorite level. <laughs> yeah. This is the best use of World Builder I've ever seen. Winston Hughes likes the idea, but really doesn't think this belongs in the strategy tips form, so he probably doesn't think this belongs in a Senate discussion on Polycast. But really, I could see that argument, but I just find that this divine intervention, you acting as God by going into the world builder, is just like a mega event. Mega. There you go. It's just not very random because you know when it's going to happen, but you don't know what's going to happen. It adds excitement. Mm. I like one of the follow-ups. Where it's like the miracle of fishes, and there's fish everywhere. <laughs> the miracle of fishes. <laughs> That's just hilarious. Yeah, if you wanted to play, like, I could see you doing this in a democracy game, actually. If it was like a one-team one, there's like a players together, and then you go in and you decide they displease the guys. You take out all their food resources. It's actually a really good idea. <laughs> Dan, the difference was he didn't go into World Builder. He had other people go into World Builder. <laughs> <laughs> and mess with him. <laughs> yeah. 
So in other words, he's just having other people do his dirty work. Well, I can do my own, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, that's one way to look at it. Until half of his sieve is destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> well, if he doesn't like the changes someone made, he can just use the <laughs> the other save that he has. So. He can spend an hour changing the city names back. There you go. <laughs> See? <laughs> the other nice thing about this thread is, in addition to the nature of it, it has lent itself to a very... Uh, narrative format. It's not just, here's the save, let's discuss the strategy, here are the screenshots, but there's actually a story revolving around it. It's novelicious. See, I was going to say something like that a minute ago, but then I was going to use the word roleplay, and I was like, roleplay and Civ, am I allowed to use those two words together? (laughs) (laughs) Well, if it was smack, you could. (laughs) Possibly. I think perhaps he should have only done this whenever a prophet was born. Oh. Here cometh the new word of gods. And he says, you've just pleased him. Poof, no military. Or maybe it's the miracle of peace. (laughs) The miracle of becoming someone else's vassal. (laughs) The miracle of losing all your technology. (laughs) Back to the Stone Ages. There's a good way for competitive play and to have other people give you advice. That's the Apulgian University. And we would find that where? Jeez. <laughs> uh, Apulgian.net slash forms? Really? Wow. How could I figure that out from Apulgian University? I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder. Call in today. In North America, the number is 301-637-7659. That's 301-637-POLY. In Europe, 44-121-288-7659. That's 44-121-288-POLY. You can Skype us at The Polycast or email us at polycast at apolton.net. For more information on Polycast, our sibling show Modcast, or about Polycast in general, log on to the series' official website at polycast.apolton.net. This is a shout-out to a certain member of a Poulton's off-topic forum. Did you know that you can listen to Polycast and pick your nose at the same time? You're now all probably wondering, what the... <laughs> um, something like that? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty random. Someone said that they would rather be picking their nose than listening to Polycast, so I'm simply pointing out that you can do both at the same time. You don't have to choose. Well, you know, I know some American Sign Language, and obviously I can't do the actual sign over a podcast. But the, the sign for boring is you pretend to pick your nose. Mm. So maybe he was saying something there. And just Anyway, I'm sitting here doing it, but you can't see it. <laughs> oh, I do a lot of things over this that Dan can't see. <laughs> well, this is a family show, all right? <laughs> so, uh, K-Man, what part of the world are you from? Uh, you are not privileged to hear that information. Uh oh. <laughs> Everyone knows that Kelly's from Candyland. Yeah, Sheepsville. So. But I mean, country wise. Oh, America. All right. I went to Canada once, though, and Mexico a couple times. Uh. I'm like all international and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. Leave that one alone. <laughs> You're continental. Continental. Yeah. yeah. Continental, if you would like to sponsor the show. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to the 37th edition of Podcast, the official podcast of Poland Civilization site. My name is Imran Siddiqui, Imran Siddiqui on the forums. I am joined by, unfortunately, Daniel Quick. Hello still, and goodbye. <laughs> also joined by Makalua. Hi, bye. Bye, hi. Eh? Also joined by K-Mad. Hi, bye. And guest co-host Michael. I don't think I'm going to get any sleep tonight at all. <laughs> so that means you want to keep going? I may as well, you know. <laughs> Till the sun comes up. Woo-hoo. So you spent all night awake. Why is that? I was doing a uh, civilization podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a celebrity now. All right, forum talk talk uh, t- t- forum talk topics. Like God came down and. <laughs> <laughs> Does this make it into bloopers or just gets cut? Both. Oh, it all gets cut. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I'll tell you what I'm hoping for. <laughs> I think the majority of Dan's editing is just Imran. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably right. <laughs> date February 2nd, 2008. Soundtrack courtesy Civilization for Warlords and Beyond the Sword. Copyright 2008, Bolton Civilization site at bolton.net.